So I, I have a special treat, I think, which is I'm going to be teaching this weekend um, and I'm coming back to this book that many of us pass through together. So I'm going to do a little meditation, our opening meditation, uh, returning to the, the beautiful wisdom stream of Wangyal Rinpoche. And tonight, as we've been kind of making our way through this beautiful text, The Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, with commentary by Pema Chodron, an 8th century text by Shantideva, which in its main purpose is intended to help us find the motivation and the tools and the energy to wake up for the sake of all beings and to really commit ourselves as compassion warriors. And it's kind of needless to say, but the world really needs it. We really need it. And um, some something's beeping. <laughs> Do we know what that is? Okay, cool. Uh -huh. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, and you know, for those of us who partake in the news. Um, there's always a lot of heaviness today, heaviness for sure. And um, hoping that if folks are coming here with a heavy heart from what's going on in the world, hello, that we can really use that as alchemical fuel for the fire of awakening. And that's a lot of what this text is about. And we have moved from the first three chapters, which the first three chapters are really kind of this, how do we understand what bodhicitta is? Like, what is an awakened heart? Why should we do that? What, what are the actual parameters? And I think, as, as maybe we've discovered for folks who've been coming, Shantideva really, he likes to go big. He's quite verbose and also <clears throat> a little dramatic. So really getting us, you know, inspired and, and in some ways um, sober to the reality that bodhicitta is the only sane option for us with this world that we live in, a world that's on fire. And that it's not just opening our heart a little to the suffering. We got to go all the way and we got to open past what we can even imagine. And that is the training ground. And that doesn't mean, you know, losing ourselves in despair and overwhelm or trying to solve every single person's issue that we can imagine. But it is this stance and this way of being. And now we get to see all the obstacles in the way of that. So the Bodhisattva training is really, you know, helping forge internally our ability to be present for others. And when we look internally, we see that there's, there's a lot of kind of holding on, a lot of grasping. And these next three chapters, we're going to, it's beautiful, we'll get into these spiritual qualities of the paramitas. So, okay, we have, at least for the, the sake of our evenings here, we're going to assume that people here think bodhicitta is a reasonable idea, and that we do want to proceed on the path of awakening our hearts for the sake of all beings. So how do we do it? This first chapter, um, which is called um, the way that Pema Children has organized it, using our intelligence or awareness, is really focused on two main things, on cultivating mindfulness of what is actually going on for us when we fall off bodhicitta, and becoming more and more aware of our difficult and distressing emotions, what are called in Tibetan our kleshas. And so I thought it would be really nice for us to start a practice tonight of these, what Wangyal Rinpoche calls these three precious pills. And in this practice, you know, the way that Pema Chodron is defining attentiveness or awareness is being able to be very intelligent in our awareness. And when I was thinking of, hmm, like what meditation supports that? Pretty much all meditation supports our awareness, and most meditations support our attention. But there's something very unique that's needed in recognizing when we are distressed, recognizing even at these subtle levels, when we have gotten into what Wangyal Rinpoche calls the pain identity or the pain body. 
so much of the time we're moving through the world, we're not even realizing that like our hands are clenched, our jaw is clenched, our heart is clenched. And there's just these ways that we kind of like hold in against the world. And these three precious pills are almost, uh, you know, are more traditionally called these, these, these doors. Um, they are ways into these qualities that are so essential for us to be ready in the world, present in the world, aware in the world. So these qualities are really finding stillness. Even saying that, finding stillness, such a refreshment, you know, such a beautiful quality. And to find stillness through the body, that the body could actually be a refuge where there is a sense of stillness. And in the traditions of, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, stillness is the natural state of the body. What a wonderful idea that our body, when it's naturally at, you know, not going somewhere, not doing something, is a body of stillness. And that doesn't mean there isn't movement and prana and all sorts of subtle energies, just that kind of stillness. Such a beautiful quality. And then the second of these doors is of silence. Okay, I mean, stillness and silence, not prioritized characteristics in our contemporary culture, right? Of what we're seeking and what we're cultivating. And yet when we think of like, oh yeah, a moment of silence, that sounds nice. That does sound like a, a refuge and a refreshment. And um, this idea of really feeling that silence is the natural state of our inner speech, even. That's, that's quite unique. That's quite a, a wonderful invitation. That doesn't mean necessarily that there are no thoughts. We're choosing instead to focus on the space around the thoughts. That's silence. In the same way, it's not that the body doesn't move or can't move, but what we're kind of focusing on, where we are resting our attention and awareness is on that quality of stillness and silence. And the third of these uh, precious pills or precious doors is finding the natural quality of our mind. And this one I think is the most startling. <laughs> Because <laughs> for most of us, the natural quality of the mind uh, is somewhere between tired and busy, right? <laughs> it's like, where, which, on which side of the spectrum am I? But that the natural quality of the mind could be not only kind of open, which is something we hear across many traditions again, um, but that it's warm. I think that is just really, it's such a subtle shift to imagine the mind as open and warm, meaning already infused with compassion, not generating compassion, just that our awareness as it is, is compassionate. Oof. Yeah, and I really do, you know, when I was um, getting ready to teach this weekend and so excited to return um, to this book that we went through together earlier in the year, really the word that just came and kept coming was, this is a true refuge, right? Come on in, find a seat. You know, being able to <clears throat> have somewhere where we can go inward and experience this stillness and this silence and this warmth and, and find that to be our true refuge. And I know for Wang Gil Rinpoche, uh, I would re-listen to our, our evening with him. So for those who weren't here, we just had the huge good fortune for him to join us um, and give teachings. And um, you can hear just in the quality of his voice how deeply he wants us all to be more free. <laughs> just very inspiring. And just the simplicity at which he is taking so many lineages uh, worth of knowledge and wisdom and making it so simple. These teachings are so simple. And yet they really have this power to transform us if we become familiar enough to know that we can rely on them. I know some of you here really resonated with these three precious pills. I think we did it, maybe that book for 
three months, four months, something like that. And um, that's enough time to familiarize. So welcome home for those who remember this practice and look forward to introducing it to you all for your first time. And again, just as threading this through the theme um, that we'll be covering in the chapter tonight of cultivating this intelligent attention. And the metaphor, I love the metaphor um, Pema Chodron talks about, the kind of attention that you pay when you're walking next to a very steep cliff. So you could imagine being at Fort Funston and like you're on a trail, but you're like aware of what's going on. And you know, the cliff here is us succumbing to despair, to, to the pain body, to our neuroses, to getting overwhelmed. Like how do we cultivate an, a wise intelligence? We have to recognize that there's pain right and and have a way to release it and find refuge so that's where we'll start yeah most of you look very at least somewhat familiar but if not welcome for your first time to the san francisco dharma collective i'm eve teacher here entirely volunteer run space uh, which we're so fortunate to have and really um, a community first or community focused orientation of the teachings here so we'll really invite folks to share and engage in community practice by listening compassionately and sharing compassionately after we do the meditation and um, throughout some of the commentaries on the text. Any questions before we get started, especially for folks at home, I assume you're comfortable, but for folks here, I, I, I've said this before, but feeling a sense of comfort in this space is like kind of the most important thing in order to be able to drop into practice so if there's something else you need physically for your body <clears throat> and or if you want to just kind of look around and really feel the sense we got Serana at the door we're very fortunate so we can really relax here friends online might be lucky enough to have like a furry animal as their I always feel like right when I need a dose of metta in my practice, like my cat will come by and I'm like, yes. And the whole body mind system lights up. So, all right. So let's give ourselves a moment to establish a posture for practice. So maybe together we can inhale our shoulders up to our ears and then exhale on our back. And twice more, inhaling up. And this last one, we can exhale through the mouth, a little sound. Ah. And finding a place where the, the neck can rest really gently and evenly on top. Sorry, the head can rest gently and evenly on top of the neck. And finding a softness, whether eyes are open or closed, just softening through the eyes. And continuing this exploration and invitation of softness through the whole face. And softening through the chest and the belly. And just feeling the incredible strength. that we can experience through the spine, the uprightness, the vividness. And as we arrive more fully in this space together, giving ourselves a moment to really have a sense of this very moment in time. 
for those of us here in the center feeling that wonderful San Francisco experience of the warmth outside as the fog is making its way towards us. That sense of maybe where the sun might be in the sky. Situating ourselves in the natural world in this moment. Feeling a sense of situating ourselves in this room, whether here in the center or at home. Feeling the quality of air around us, the beings around us. And then inviting our attention and awareness to fully saturate the body. And finding this wonderful balance of noticing the subtle energies moving through the body while also considering feeling this body's natural state of stillness. The more that we notice the body, somewhat paradoxically, the body can start to feel a sense of spaciousness. And so the stillness could permeate the entire body, maybe even soften some of the perimeters of where the body begins and what surrounds the body starts. Whenever the mind gets carried away by thoughts, memories, or images, just relax and release and return to exploring this sense of refuge with the body as a body of stillness.
without trying to feel anything in particular, just noticing what it feels like in this body when we allow the stillness to be surfaced and experienced. Relaxing, releasing, returning. And continuing to deepen just a bit longer. This full presence of our awareness, our attentiveness to the body, the myriad sensations that may be moving through and around. Maybe we touch upon areas where there's a density of feeling or emotion. And with all that we experience through the tactile sensations of the body, continuing to invite and make room for the stillness that can also be within the body. without leaving the sense of stillness in the body. 
Let me move towards opening this door towards the silence of inner speech. Focusing on the breath, allowing the mind to settle. And thoughts, memories, and images will still arise. This deliberate, intentional attentiveness to the silence, which is also always already there. Breathing in, knowing we are breathing in, breathing out, bringing the knowing to breathing out. When we get caught up and carried away and then return to this intentional silence and following of the breath, maybe we notice a bit of relief, like after you've been somewhere really loud and busy and you just come home to the peace and to the quiet. So finding that intentional choice towards silence and releasing the chatter and busyness of inner speech. Training in our attentiveness is a willingness to come back every single time without self-criticism or regret. Just keep coming back, noticing the breath, settling into the natural state of stillness and silence.
And a couple more breaths, really connecting with the subtleness of knowing the breath. Not thinking about the breath, not even trying to imagine or feel it in a specific way, just knowing we are breathing in, breathing out. And with the body in its natural state of stillness and the speech settling into silence, we invite ourselves to settle the mind in this natural state of warmth and openness. This openness could feel as though we experience the awareness of what's in front of us, an awareness of the space which is behind us, above, below, all around. Feel or imagine no boundary to our awareness. permeating this entire field of awareness without beginning or end is this warmth, the natural light of the heart. Just the most core spark of our care, our kindness. Feel that as essentially part of the awareness that is all around us. <coughs> Thich Nhat Hanh might call this the smiling at the heart, the gladdening of the heart. A warmth and gladdening without any target or focus, but that is part of awareness itself. Awareness can hold that too. Noticing, settling back.
settling the mind in its natural state of openness and warmth could feel almost as though we were leaning back in the mind. Again, if we've been carried away, bringing our attentiveness and simply returning. And this returning could feel like that leaning back from whatever it was that captured and filled our attentional space. Leaning back and finding more openness and the presence of warmth. A simple care, kindness. For a couple more moments, really refreshing how these three precious doors are all manifest, feeling the fullness of the body, of stillness. It gives way to the silence of inner speech. And beautifully held within this mind of openness and warmth. Thank you for your practice.
<clears throat> Thank you, Coco, for your practice. Any questions or reflections on that practice for folks here in the room uh, using the mic for friends online you can raise your hand. Be curious for people who uh, are returning to the practice. What did you notice about returning to this practice after a couple months since we've done it together? Yes. Well, thank you. That was really nice. Uh, one thing I, I noticed, I wish I could remember it more often when I'm out in the world. I, mm. I feel like sometimes I can do Tonglen now kind of on the spot. Cool. You know, but it took a long time. Yeah. And it happens every so often, but I was just traveling a lot and in really crowded places and loud and like overwhelming places. And I really wish I would have remembered. And I don't think I did. Yeah. Like the whole time. Yeah. To touch back into the, the silent, but it was already there. Yeah. And I, I didn't remember to do that. So I, there was a little bit of regret that mm. like, oh, I wish I would have, yeah, I could have remembered somehow to do this when in those difficult moments. Yeah. But other than that here, it was really nice. Mm. It was really warm. I was really trying to remember the warmth and it felt really just great and really beautiful. So thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I see that in you. Yeah. And you know, all us, Buddhist teachers would be out of a job if you guys remembered what we said. The same thing every week. Same thing. That's the trick. Unfortunately, it's really hard to remember. But so nice when we do get to come home and really like be like, oh yeah, this is here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think I see Jason and then Claudia. Feeling better, Jason? Oh, oh, wait, sorry, we got to turn up the volume. One moment, one moment. Wow, the sound guy can't be heard. What's the irony? Is that a... Oh, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. Is that you? Okay, let's try Claudia. Claudia, can we... Oh, hey! The sound guy. Yeah. I was going to say my voice is not better but i am so okay good i only ha I'll, I'll speak shortly <clears throat> quickly um i i really love this three pills uh precious preciousness and i remember his smile and that mm. was a truly truly moving and wonderful session uh and the one thing that really occurred to me this time was when we got to the point of silence uh i was really drawn to the amount of words in my brain that mm. I use constantly, even when I'm meditating, like chants or mantras or like just saying now, you know, like using language, it's not necessarily discursive thought, like Matthew Brenselver talks about discursive thought. Uh, it's just like this kind of using the voice to kind of uh, the inner voice to calm. And then I tried to stop doing that. And I was like, this is hard. Right. I, I feel mm. like that's kind of just what I wanted to ask about is like, are we, the, the, the voice that's always going is, is so prevalent that yeah. um, I'm just trying to figure out like how much can I actually really get silent? And, and I'm just, I'm just kind of curious to so take my answer off the thing, but I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Glad you're feeling better. Um, Again, you know, what really struck me, and I think Rinpoche spoke about it when he was talking with us, and for sure in the book, is the, the inner chatter, even if it's helpful, of like you were saying, maybe it's giving you instruction on um, where to go next in your practice. It's, it's just this, this like preference. 
not that it goes away, but it's a I'm going to preference or I'm going to put forward silence. And it's different. I mean, you know, it's much easier. I'm sure we've all noticed this. If there's people next to you talking in a language that you don't understand to not listen to the conversation, you're like, no, nah, that's easy. But how do we not listen to our own internal conversation? So it's like, OK, I'm aware this is happening, but let's pretend it's like another language. <laughs> and then so it's there. Um, and it's yeah, it is. You know, it's interesting in the text. There's so many more layers to each of these practices. So the, um, the body, you know, and, and stillness is kind of also thought to be this body of emptiness. So we might notice in the practice that you're focusing on the body and you're focusing on the body and it's like, well, where's the body? There's just a lot of kind of porousness going on. And then with the um, settling the speech into its natural state, it's often, you know, he describes it as the body of light. And so instead of focusing on the sound, you know, we're kind of quieting and quieting and we might experience a sense of light or lightness. Um, so I think there's, it's also, you know, not giving into the allure of our extremely verbal minds. And I don't use discursive thoughts because I think I, I love the term. It's a lot of my teachers use it, but it seems a little complicated um, to me. Discursive is not a word we use in our everyday language. It's really just content, you know, just thoughts, content, thoughts. And it's so compelling, but it's only one of our channels of language. And I can't remember if someone who was sitting over here was describing that when they kind of got quiet enough in their practice, they experienced something that wasn't language, but that felt like a thought. And, and we can get there, right? We can have a non-language thought. We're so language dominant, so language oriented. And so just to be open to, to that is also, it might give us a bit, you know, we're, we're kind of hooked on the thinking and hooked on thinking our thoughts are really compelling. So whatever we can do, it's like, hmm, what else might I notice if I can just not listen to that inner dialogue and find the silence, maybe feel the light. So yeah, thanks, Jason. Claudia. Yeah, thank you. Um, I love this practice. And at times I've been able to go pretty deep, you know, into a really a feeling of like really infinite expansiveness, just, just really wonderful. But tonight was not it. <laughs> I uh I mean I I tried to still my body and then the thoughts and at some point I was able to silence the speech but I was really having a hard time getting my body to be still it was very mm. antsy very yeah. and I did exercise today I mean I I I went swimming you know and so it's not like I haven't moved but I was super antsy. My legs just kept on trying to move. So I was wondering if you have any suggestions as to what to do in those cases, because he was really restless. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It's a great question. And, you know, our body can have that desire or urge to move because of um, kind of more physical needs and also, you know, emotional uh, experiences that kind of can create some agitation in the body or movement in the body. And just as we can still have thoughts that arise when we're focusing on silence, we can still have movements that arise. Um, it's again, what we're, you know, when we think of like our awareness, our attention, it's like a limited real estate. <laughs> And when we're focusing on, you know, the thought or we're focusing on the sensation, like the movement, it's like nothing else is available. Like it, it's like an eclipse. It, it completely covers for a moment. So the, the goal or the aspiration with these practices is not to completely get rid of movement or um, speech, but to 
really focus on what else exists in the frame. And so while still moving, you know, having an intentionality of placing attention and awareness away from. And this is really hard too. I think, you know, Tara last week or the week before talked about body pain. That's really hard. You know, a lot of us experience body pain in the practice and it can be distracting. And to not make the pain a problem, such mm -hmm. a huge part of the practice. And so to soften around, yeah, the body's moving and there's still stillness or the body hurts and there's still stillness. Just this opportunity, you know, such an unbelievable choice point that we have to deliberately choose where we put our attention. It's like everything. So, yeah. Thanks, Thank Claudia. Thanks. When do we see you back here? End of this month. Yes. Hooray. <laughs> Wonderful. Ready to get involved in the writing postcards and oh, good. other things. Anyway. Dia de los Muertos. Yes. Yeah. Harley Strictly. <laughs> 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 all kinds of things <laughs> okay good thanks um, and Claudia your your question gave me lots of thoughts um, and the, the question of um, how this compared to when we first came across it um, I always use the three pills mm. as my kind of check engine lights <laughs> but from the very beginning, I would always skip as fast as possible to spaciousness. <laughs> love spaciousness. Let's go right there. Part of it is I also have a lot of I have a lot of chronic pain, mm -hmm. back pain, the pain in other parts. Yeah. Um, and I was like, all right, stillness. Okay. Well, check. Let's get to the next one. <laughs> and then quietness was always um, when we first came across when I first came came across it through your teachings. Yeah. Um, there's I mean, there's a lot going on. Um, I was like, all right, let's go straight to let's go straight to spaciousness. And, yeah. And and something in the way that you presented it today as um, and, and quietness and stillness, and then I heard it as true nature of the mind. Mm. It kind of tricked me out of that jumping right to spaciousness mm. in a really helpful way. Mm. Um, and something that I've been experiencing in the last few months of meditation is that some of the the way that my mind creates thoughts is mm. very similar to the way my body creates pain mm. and that in the same way that mm. i have to have some grace for the thoughts and just my my number way one way that i do that is i go you can still be have it whoever's having that thought in there you can still think it just go do it over there yeah um because I'm so afraid that I'm going to lose the thought. So it's easier if I just decide that the thought is still happening. I just can't see it. It's cool. Mm -hmm. It's very similar with the pain. Um, I had a lot of back pain today. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of sitting pain sometimes and came through it today. Yeah. And I have a similar vibe on it. I'm like, cool. you can do your thing. Yes. And sometimes it really sucks. Yeah. But treating it like a thought yeah. has been really helpful. Um, mm. And I think today's meditation kind of forced me to do that a little bit more. Mm. And then the unconfigured nature of the, or the, the, yeah. the true nature of the mind, yeah. it got very tree-like. Mm. And I had a, a vision around, or an experience around, uh, there's a particular spot I really like, a particular tree I really like. Mm. And when it's windy, you can't really tell the difference between what the leaves are and what the wind is. Mm. They're just moving together. Beautiful. Um, so I, that was a brief moment of mm. that. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, just, yeah, really moving that idea that <laughs> the body painting is like the mind thinking. Yeah, I think that's a very powerful insight to have. And yeah, it's, it's a tricky one <clears throat> for us to rest in because it, it feels like it's happening to us. And, and it is, right? You're not asking for it. But that, you know, the pain body at its essence, right, when we feel discomfort or pain, it's contraction, right? So in a funny way, it's not that thinking is contraction, but getting caught up in thoughts is contraction, you know? Getting caught up in the pain is contraction. So to really, like, keep the openness with whatever's happening. So you're still getting to the, 
you know, mind in its natural state, and you're allowing, you know, these other dimensions of our sensory experience to be part of it. Because we can't, if we skip to, as my teacher says, you know, premature transcendence, which I find hilarious, <laughs> we've lost the body, right? And we've lost a lot of the things that actually in our day to day are obstacles on the path. Um, you know, our experience in the body or our emotions. Um, so I think it's really helpful to continue training <clears throat> with the thoughts and their difficult content with the body. And, you know, maybe we'll do the uh, Vedana practice next week. because I think also the feeling tone of recognizing like the subtle unpleasantness that we're always attributing in our body and on, also in our thoughts. Not all thoughts are the same. You know, doing practice with thoughts, it's very entertaining. Um, it can be a bit distracting, but it can be really interesting to just notice when are my thoughts feeling that kind of stickier, more contracted, and when is it like easy to let them go? And I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, this research that now, it's funny because I remember when it came out, it was so groundbreaking uh, to have research on the content of our thoughts using I think they were using, you know, not quite smartphones at the time, but having people track how they were feeling, what they were doing, what they were thinking. So like your emotional state and what's going on and discovering that the majority of our mind wandering is unpleasant. Maybe one thing if we're getting caught up in thoughts and it was pleasant, but that's very actually not the case. A lot of our thoughts we're getting caught up on are unpleasant and yet we're still hooked. So, yeah. Yes. What's the difference between, right now you mentioned, you know, losing the body, I guess when we're trying to avoid pain, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, like Ralph mentions, like just passing through that yeah. part of the meditation. Yeah. Versus losing the body when you get Dissolve. to a point of just like, well, you're, you know, so is it the same thing or is it? It's such a good question. I mean, it's, it's kind of so, and what you're alluding to, just in case folks don't know that is, you know, sometimes the continuous and you might have, some folks might have experienced this, the continuous noticing of the body and noticing of the body. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, there is this form body and then there's our subtle body and the subtle body qualitatively feels bigger than the form body and the awareness body even bigger than that. And this experience of dissolution or kind of softening through the perimeters, um, you know, as a, as a researcher or scientist, we can't prove any of this, da, 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 but you know, thousands of years of texts and practice definitely seems to be a very interesting element of you know proprioception or interoception our body awareness of our body in space or feeling of our body and that comes naturally when the subtle body is relaxed whereas if we're trying to like push through and not feel the body we're actually kind of again contracting and suppressing the body to just be in the mind and there's a lot of meditation practices where we feel great bliss states through the mind and we feel a lot of interest and openness through the mind and that may that may so there's like a top down and a bottom up that bliss that we're kind of cultivating not that the mind's here but that we're cultivating um, that might end up really softening the whole body and we'll have that sense of bodily release and there's also a possibility in practice that we just try to divorce ourselves from the body in the same way that we divorce ourselves from our body when we're caught up in rumination about what's wrong in our life like we're not aware, right? We're like, what's gonna like? Oh yeah, I had a last night. I like woke up and it was like classic life admin. Like, did you respond to that email? Did you pay that bill? Did you? It was like all that stuff. I was not embodied at all, right? I was completely in my mind. So there's like a difference of losing the body through the body opening, and losing the body through a separation between body and mind. Great question. Yeah. How does that land for you, being someone who works so much with the body? I ask that question because, it, you know, I, in this meditation, was super nice and I lost my body, but I lost it in a, in a way where 
it, you know, I, I was just, I was just deep in the meditation. Um, interestingly, when I heard the the alarm go off, and you know, for me, alarms are triggering because I'm always aware of my surroundings. Yeah. Um, my heart just like it just started pounding, mm. but it was just my heart. I didn't feel my body. You know. <laughs> That's really interesting. And then very, very quickly, just like that, because um, I realized, okay, you know, it's we're safe. Um, it went away. Mm. So going back to your question earlier that you first posed is, how was it coming back? It mm. was a lot easier yeah. coming back the second time around. It's like kind of like riding a bicycle. Yeah. Um, but it was just interesting that I just like, I, you know, I had a sense of um, an increase in heart rate, but, I, you know, I didn't feel my 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 body yeah which I, you know so it's just a, that's really interesting yeah i'm i'm sure there's like six texts in tibetan buddhism on that exactly but i don't know those yeah. um, i was also comparing long time to this three pills practice and they feel very different somatically mm. And I am trying to think about when is the best time to use either one of them. Like, what would be the situation that I would choose silence or the openness? Which yeah. Is the long term for these thoughts that come. It seems to be that's the use for the, the one that we did today. It's the just internal dialogue. Well, shut up. But yeah. Long, kind of long, do you mean Tonglen? Tonglen. Got it. Yeah. Long ten. Long ten. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think Tonglen is really um, beautifully suited for, like, especially kind of an acute emotional, like the squeeze of the heart. Um, so some folks might have seen the news today about um, the school shooting, which is just, and there's like an immediate, like, full body heart squeeze with that and practicing Tonglen on the spot where you recognize this is so great suffering for all these beings and the beings connected to these beings. and you really let the heart then kind of radiate, you know, that aspiration of compassion. And the three precious pills, I think, I think they work, and this, it was interesting, I was thinking about this today, I think they work really well with, with just our overall pain body, our overall difficulties that we're going through with our low level stress about like everything <laughs> about being a human. So I think we can use them more and maybe Tong Glen's like a little bit of a heavier hammer for us and then also i think grace it's great to experiment and like see a situation that arises like oh this kind of happens often let me try both you know and see how it goes uh both at the same time nope okay <laughs> if there's a situation that occurs I'll try, a lot I'll try that. <laughs> yeah yeah same time might be a little too much but yeah yes please beautiful reflections and questions everybody thank you so much Mine is not going to be so beautiful because I'm going to talk about Coco. Okay. <laughs> Wednesdays. Yeah. He is completely aware he doesn't go to sleep because usually he's asleep like between two and four. He's, he doesn't sleep at all because he's waiting to come. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have any other answer. <laughs> and I mean, he's quiet, he's nice, he's, he's not the same dog that he usually is. <laughs> <laughs> There's some past life momentum between Coco and I, I yeah, think. That's, that's right. That's right. Well, I only wanted to say that because yeah. really it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes, I knew it the first time I saw Coco. Um, yeah. Just really, I do feel so appreciative of what everybody shared, so much wisdom, just through, you know, really paying attention to our practice. And I think, you know, it can feel like, okay, okay, but like, let's get to the book, the teachings. But this is the teachings, right? Is the practice and how it lives in us and our ability to understand it. So, yeah, fantastic. So then, yeah, I love this. I love these next couple chapters. I mean, I love it all, but I do love these next couple chapters. There's some real zingers here that we could make t-shirts out of. Um, just extremely inspiring. 
So one, <clears throat> the way that Pema Chodron opens this chapter is saying that, you know, what's really, what's really important for us on the Bodhisattva path, she says, it's not about being a good person. It's about courage and willingness to keep growing. So there's a lot of these phrases of like, you know, my God, it's so easy to fall off the path. I can start my day and think all I want is to, you know, have my heart open for all beings. All I want is to be a slightly kinder person. And then it's just so easy to fall off. And that to really stay curious about that. Um, and, you know, she describes it as a, a youthful curiosity to stretch the heart beyond its preconceptions and biases. So just, you know, really having the enthusiasm. And uh, yeah, I, I like, so she's saying, you know, you can call what is described and what is um, translated in Tibetan is pagyu, which is awareness. But she says translating awareness as conscientiousness, heedfulness, carefulness, um, like this walking by the edge of the cliff. And one of the two main parts, as I mentioned before in this chapter, is both on attentiveness and on kleshas. Uh, kleshas are a strong emotion that reliably leads to suffering, sometimes translated as neurosis or afflictions or defiled emotions. Kleshas are dynamic, ineffable energy but energy that enslaves us and causes us to act and speak in unintentional ways. Kleshas arise with the subtle tension inherent in dualistic perception. And if we don't catch this tension, it sets off a chain reaction of for and against. It's like such a dense two sentences. There's so much in here. And it's interesting because, you know, Klesha doesn't even come up directly in the text. And sometimes I feel like, Pema is using the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life to just like drop all these jewels, you know, <laughs> of wisdom on us. And so Klesha, you know, in, in the training and teaching I do of cultivating emotional balance, we would call the Klesha destructive emotion. So not that anger or fear or sadness are bad, but we can respond in ways that are harmful towards others. And when we're doing so, we're really operating out of you know, what she's saying here is, is ignorance, not seeing clearly. We're operating, we act in a harmful way, you know, in a destructive way, because we think that there's someone out there doing something to us. Like we lose sight of our equanimity, we lose sight of our compassion. Um, trying to think of a good destructive emotion episode I've had recently. Um, had a kind of a good day. Uh, oh, yeah, it's totally ridiculous. Um, you know, they're like this, like even like the simple thing. <laughs> uh, I'm really paranoid. I, I should just knock on wood. Like everybody's had COVID. Who in this room's had COVID recently? Like everybody's had COVID recently. And anyway, I know so many people I really don't want to get it again, you know? And I was in the supermarket and I was trying to be kind of conscientious and there was someone who's standing really close to me and it felt like they were breathing heavy and coughing. <laughs> And I got like, I kept like moving away from them. I swear, I was like, are you following me? Yeah. Like, there's plenty of room here. You can cough somewhere else. But I had that tightness, right? Instead of like, oh, I'm gonna move somewhere else in this, you know, whatever. Or like, they also want granola. Oh my God, <laughs> like, it's not about me. Like that tightening and that narrowing, like the cliche is when we feel the emotion and we give in to it's them against me. Right, so that's the kind of energy of the klesha. And you know, she says this, and kleshas arise with subtle tension inherent in dualistic perception. If we don't catch the tension, it sets off a chain reaction of for or against. And so back to the pain body, right? That, that clenching, that tightening, right? That's right there. These reactions quickly escalate, resulting in full-blown aggression, craving, ignorance, jealousy, envy, and pride. In other words, full-blown misery for ourselves and others. Kleshas survive on ignorance, ignorance of their insubstantial nature and the way we reinforce them. They are fueled by thoughts. Again, just like such powerful little teachings here, fueled by ignorance, right? So not seeing things clearly like this person, whether or not they have COVID is not trying to spread it to me, right? And I can move around. 
Um, and also, you know, that it, it makes me miserable. And then if I'd said something to this person, which luckily I didn't, it would make them miserable, you know, that it's just, it's so, it's so, um, yeah, it's so powerful how these invisible forces have so much weight on us and that they survive on ignorance of their insubstantial nature. Meaning that this emotion I had, if we hadn't met here tonight, I would have never remembered that this person was aggressively trying to cough on me. Just kidding. <laughs> this person was doing their own thing near where I was. Um, like I would have never remembered it because it comes and goes, right? And that, so we're ignorant both of the insubstantial nature. It's gonna come and go. Like it's really no big deal. In the moment of our klesha, we are completely forgetting that. And that we also reinforce it. Like we make it worse with the thoughts, right? Like the thinking and the holding on to <clears throat> exacerbates them. Um, and their power can be diffused by attentiveness is the main theme. So that's how she's bringing it back. That attentiveness, recognizing right when that subtle tension inherent in dualistic perception arises, right when you're making the other out of someone and so that involves, you know, recognizing in the body, in the mind, like, what is it like when I start slipping into the self other and, you know, they are a problem, which is probably like the opposite of the bodhisattva aspiration, right? Like, may I wake up to serve you versus get away from me, <laughs> you're a problem. <laughs> like, it's just, yeah, it's right there. So Shanti Deva <clears throat> says, you know, um, those of us who have firmly grasped this bodhicitta should never turn aside from it, but always strive to keep its disciplines. Whatever was begun without due heed and all that was not properly conceived, although a promise and a pledge were given, it is right to hesitate, to press on or draw back, Mm -hmm. Yet all the Buddhas and their heirs have thought this in their great wisdom. I myself have weighed and pondered it. So why now should I hesitate and doubt? For if I bind myself with promises, but fail to carry out my words and deed, then every being will have been betrayed. What destiny must lie in store for me? If in the teachings it is said that one who in thought that intends to give away a little thing, but then draws back, we will take rebirth among the hungry ghosts. How can I expect a happy destiny if from my heart I summon wandering beings to the highest bliss, but then deceive them and let them down? So again, the big drama of um, Shantideva here, just kind of like the highlights of you know, whatever was begun without due heed, you know, so this lack of attentiveness to what we're doing, and it wasn't properly conceived, even though we made a pledge to become bodhisattvas in our first three chapters, you can hesitate and draw back. And that when we hesitate, we are betraying all beings, <laughs> every being. Um, because if we've made this promise, but we fail to carry it out, I will have betrayed all beings. And, you know, this, and it is said that one who has in thought intends to give away a little, but then draws back, will take rebirth among the hungry ghosts. And this isn't kind of theoretical. Like if we are saying, I really want to open my heart, I really want to care. And we're like, oh, but not today. Like, I'm not feeling too good. Like, I'm going to keep mine over here. And I, I see that person suffering or some difficult thing I could attend to, but I'm going to look away. You know, when we are not caring for and intending and including others in our heart, we become greedy, right? Like we in our natural state of self-centeredness, that is being a hungry ghost. Not because being self-centered, you know, intrinsically makes you unhappy. It's because everything you want to enjoy by being self-centered naturally is unsatisfying. You know, like, even if you're like, I just, I just need this day to be about me, like, just about me. That's not actually very fun, right? And it's not enjoyable. And after you've had, like, a donut and 
coffee and an ice cream. Like you've had all the worldly things, you've ignored everything. Like it's actually not satisfying. The hungry ghost has this endless desire, this huge stomach and this tiny mouth. There's no satisfaction. So here he's pointing to any satisfaction we're looking to in the material realm, it's unsatisfying, right? You, you want actually, um, so how can, and like, how could I expect a happy destiny if I am promising, you know, to really be of service, but then I, I kind of turn away. And I think uh, what I love Pema does here is, is helping us not feel like whenever we're greedy or whenever we like turn the other way that we failed as bodhisattvas. She says, um, you know, uh, when we are reneging on the bodhisattva vow, it doesn't, it's okay to not feel up to the tasks. What we're doing is opting for our own comfort and security. If, but if we opt for our own comfort and security on a permanent basis, that's when we failed. So not like one day or one time, but it's actually the whole, like she says, these temporary lapses should be expected. But if we, like, if we let it completely go out, if we repress our appetite for challenge and growth, the consequences will be very sad. And there's a, <clears throat> these two other verses here that uh, she, it's, uh, Shanti Deva says, and as for those who losing bodhicitta, so you've let the spark of, you know what, it's too hard, I can't have my heart open for all beings, I'm not into this. And as for those who losing bodhicitta, nonetheless attain liberation, this is through the inconceivable effect of karma, only understood by the omniscient. In a million years, I would never have been able to interpret this the way she did. Um, but these, this verse, really specifically, it talks about you know, the importance of bodhicitta, not just in one lifetime, but in many lifetimes. And if that is not in your worldview, no problem. But according to these texts, we can have bodhicitta that has like, come into this lifetime with it with us. And um, you may also not believe me, but if you ended up in this room tonight, you probably made a bodhisattva vow in another lifetime, because you're here. You could be anywhere else. And this desire to wake up and to be able to have compassion for ourselves and all beings kind of follows us. And there's a, a story about Shariputta, who we might remember from Old Path White Clouds. And he is one of um, the Buddha's kind of senior students. And, you know, in the Heart Sutra, you hear Shariputta, just, you know, he's often a foil for Buddha. So the Buddha will, you know, have Shariputta ask questions that everybody else wants to ask, but feels too embarrassed. You know, like, what is, you know, what is emptiness? And he's like, oh, sorry, thank you for asking Shariputta. Let me tell you this. So he's such a accomplished arhat and puts himself there. But apparently in another lifetime, Shariputta, you know, because many lifetimes to wake up, he was, he met a starving ogre this is the story, um, and he and the uh, the starving ogre said, "I'm so hungry um, that in, the only thing that will satisfy me is if I can eat your arm." And so Shariputra just cut off his arm and offered it to the ogre, and the ogre said, "No, I wanted the other arm." <laughs> And he let go of bodhicitta in that moment. He's like, I'm fucking done. <laughs> I just cut off my arm for this ogre. And now, and, um, <laughs> but he had enough momentum from even that act. They ended up as Buddha's disciple. So not all hope was lost. But I love like what Pema says then is when bodhisattvas pledge themselves to work with increasingly difficult situations, they are asking for trouble. We have to face the fact that this includes working with the unreasonableness of sentient beings. So when we sign up as bodhisattvas, we are signing up to deal with unreasonableness, which there's like so much of. Uh, so I really, I appreciate her highlighting, you know, the bodhisattva vow is for the sake of all beings, including the most unreasonable <laughs> who we encounter, who wanted our other arm. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. And then, yeah, you know, the, again, what Shanti Deva is saying is 
the gravest of all bodhisattva downfalls should it forever come to pass, um, meaning when you, if you let go of bodhicitta that has been ignited, there's kind of no greater treasure that you could be like casting aside. Like once that awakening for compassion comes, um, he said, and then Pema says, the greatest mistake <clears throat> is to turn away permanently from the challenges of the world. Some discouragement is unavoidable but if we completely give up on our longing and passion to extend ourselves, then, you know, we'll lose it altogether. <laughs> and there's a lot more on what can happen wrong if you give up on bodhicitta. Uh, and then we get to, therefore, I will act devotedly according to the promise I have made. For if I fail to apply myself, <clears throat> I'll fall from low to even lower states. Striving for the benefit of all that lives, unnumbered Buddhas have already lived and passed. But I, by virtue of my failings, um, to come within the compass of these healing works. And this is where, I think I have time, I just want to add this one other teaching. I would have never in these verses read this, but this striving for the benefit of all that lives, unnumbered Buddhas have already lived and passed. So Shantideva is pointing out here that so many, especially in, in his time, but you know, in our time too, we see so many amazing accomplished teachers who are using these practices and living these practices of compassion and nonviolence. And, but if we give up, we miss out on the blessings of these people, of like seeing their example. So I always think of the Dalai Lama, just this man of peace and, you know, after so many uh, trials and tribulations really feels that his life has served the greatest purpose possible, even living in exile, even with his people struggling and suffering, just really using everything to wake up on the path so that we could miss the blessing of that. And there's these, some of you might be aware of these kind of classic teachings um, on the three pots and what prevents us from receiving the teachings or what is being called here the blessings of these Buddhas of past, the blessings of recognizing the power of the teachings. And we can have this be an analogy for what is called a mind that is like one of the three pots. And so in the three pots, there's one that's full one that has poison in it, and one that has a hole in the bottom. And these are often described as states of mind we need to be conscientious of before we receive teachings. So the pot that's too full, sound familiar? Like we already know, we've done all the workshops, we've had all the trainings, like, no, 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 I'm good, I've, I've heard this, I know this, right? That attitude will prevent us from like hearing these teachings, receiving the blessings, pot that's too full. I know that. Anybody resemble that pot sometimes? Yeah, right? Sometimes we're just like, no, I, yeah, yeah, I know. And then um, she says, it's filled to the brim, like a mind full of opinions and preconceptions. We know it all. We have so many fixed ideas. Nothing new can affect us or, ca or, or cause us to question our assumptions. We've lost that curiosity. And then there's a pot containing poison. Anybody know what that mind state is like? Like everything sucks. This world is like horrible. It's hopeless, right? Um, so she's saying it's a mind that's so cynical and critical and judgmental. Everything is poisoned. You know those people you're in conversation with and like they blame, it's like blame, 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 blame. Like this sucks, that sucks, everything sucks. This happened to me, right? That whole mind state, which is actually completely reasonable because so many things do suck, right? And are so bad. But to have that be the way you enter and encounter the world, right? You're just, it's lacking the curiosity, lacking the bigger view. Um, so that's the kind of pot with poison in it. And then a pot with a hole in it, it's like all of us on our phones all the time, right? Forgetting. It's the distracted. <clears throat> So um, our body is present, but we're lost in thought. We're so busy thinking about our dream vacation or what's for dinner um, that we don't even recognize what's being said. Like we can't even make space. And it's, it's hard, right? <clears throat> for many of us, we lead extremely full lives and to not be that pot with a hole in it, right? Where we're like, 
I think I heard a podcast, or maybe it was a book, or maybe someone said something, and it was profound, but I don't remember what it was. You know what I'm talking about? It was great. You know, it's like too much in. And um, it can be really interesting for us to notice how we fill the space. Um, I do these periodic kind of <clears throat> cleanses and um, remove podcasts and recognize my strong <laughs> attachment to getting new information. And you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to see, like, what am I doing with that new information I'm getting? Like, really, I mean, exception being, of course, that RuPaul podcast from a couple of weeks back that I mentioned. It's a great source of wisdom, though I can almost tell you nothing about it now. <laughs> so it's like, it's really interesting to pay attention. You know, what teachings are we receiving and can we, and I like this term, can we receive the blessings of these teachings um, to be aware of our mind state? So with that, let's really drop into our bodhicitta. <clears throat> so settling the body and the speech and the mind. And feel and connect with that basic spark of caring and compassion that we wish more beings were free from suffering. And then we do this outrageous expansion of that and consider making that spark into a flame in which we wish that all beings across all time for as long as space remains. May we dedicate our heart, our energy, our practice to be like an island for those who need landfall, a lamp for those needing light, to dedicate ourselves to be both medicine and doctor for those who are sick and weary. And if it's comfortable to place hands in front of the heart as a gesture of offering, we dedicate this practice, this time together, so that each and every being of all time could be completely and perfectly free. Very special to be here with you all tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks friends online. Thanks to the volunteers. <clears throat> um, I'm sure we have something special this weekend. Oh, isn't Alejandra back this weekend? So Alejandra, uh, for those who don't know her, she came a couple weeks back, does an amazing course on how to bring spiritual practice into conscious communication working with conflict, working with others. She's a dear Dharma sister, an amazing teacher, and she'll be here on Saturday, Saturday, 